<clears throat> you probably already know why I'm here. It seems of late a lot of you are having trouble keeping your patients alive, and in almost every case, this is strictly against the patient's wishes. Well, we want to make sure that when a patient comes to us, and one, they are not already pretty much goners, and two, they are not hoping to exit the material realm at this time, that we can at least competently approach this goal with preparedness and timeliness and healthiness. Okay, probably the quickest way patients die is from problems with their airway. See, the body is pretty self-sufficient and can survive a lot of extreme conditions like drought and starvation and boredom. But the second you take oxygen out of the equation, you start to see just how fragile and insignificant we really are. The point is, you need to recognize the potential for problems before your patient is gasping for air. Besides, have you ever seen someone turn all blue with their eyes bugging out and stuff? What am I saying? Of course you have. That's why I'm here. Anyway, I'm sure you'll agree it's disgusting and not something any nurse should have to go home and fall asleep thinking about. But respiratory issues are not a death sentence. Lots of people with chronic respiratory illnesses lead normal or even very accomplished lives. It's up to us as nurses to help them do this. So to start off, let's consider some of the problems we see when a patient doesn't have good gas exchange. So this is a little embarrassing that you are killing your patients just because you can't manage their airway properly. This is step one in making sure your patient stays alive and you all so-called nurses can't even do that. Since you obviously think that oxygen isn't important in sustaining life, let me refresh your memories about what exactly oxygen does for the human body. Oxygen diffuses through membranes and into our red blood cells after inhalation, which is when you breathe in, just in case you forgot. After being carried in blood, oxygen is sent to a body tissue, which also needs oxygen. There is an enzyme, monooxygenase, I can spell it for you if you need to, but that uses oxygen to catalyze many oxidation reactions in the body, aka metabolism. Carbon dioxide, a waste product, is released from the cell and into the blood, where it combines with bicarbonate and hemoglobin for transport to the lungs. Blood circulates back to the lungs and the process repeats itself. It's well known that after about 9 minutes of no oxygen from drowning or not being intubated correctly, you can kiss your brain goodbye. Brain cells are extremely sensitive to oxygen deprivation and can begin to die within 5 minutes after oxygen supply has been cut off. If you all think that we can live without oxygen and think that it is okay to not manage our patient's airways correctly, then you have another thing coming. Our lungs, blood, and tissues need oxygen, and there is no ifs, ands, or buts about it. My name is Nadine. That's N-A-D-E-E-E-N-E. -E -E -E. Nadine. Now, the body's pH, or acid-base balance, is a very particular beast. For people to be healthy, it's got to stay within a very slim little range. We're talking high school cheerleader slim, between 7.35 and 7.45. Now, y'all may already know this, but there are a number of conditions out there that'll do a number on you if you ain't careful. Did I ever tell y'all about that little patient I had back in the day? Never forget him. Name it Jimmy. Wait, wait, no, Timmy. Wait, oh hell. The details ain't so important, right? It was what little Jimmy Timmy done that matters. He must have been only six or seven years old, swallowed himself a whole entire box of baking soda. Well, by the time anybody knew there was a problem, little Jimmy Timmy was on the floor, hardly a breath passing his little blue lips, heart pounding 187 miles an hour, and just a quivering all over. His mama found the empty box and the guilty spoon and brought him along to the hospital so as we'd know what to do. Well, that was all the evidence we needed. Little Timmy Jimmy was in metabolic alkylosis, folks, and fixin' to be put on a ventilator if he didn't start perking up right quick. Well, we did all we could, which was to say we gave him a potassium sparing loop diuretic to get rid of all that bicarb and extra fluids to keep him hydrated. 
It was a narrow miss, but no intubation for Jimmy Timmy this time. Can't say the same for poor old Myrtle, though. Now, Myrtle, she was the church organist for 30-odd years. I used to run into her at the supermarket, her buying sweets for those bratty grandkids of hers, and me buying a nice big bottle of vodka, uh, ketchup, that is, ketchup. Anyway, dear old Myrtle used to smoke like a locomotive, and when she got to be about 50 or so, it finally caught up with her. Developed COPD and couldn't catch a breath to save her life. Well, one night, when I was working the night shift, Old Myrtle shows up at the ER talking nonsense and falling all over the place. Didn't hardly have no blood pressure to speak of and complaining of a terrible headache. Well, old smarty pants ER doc says, She's a chronic COP deer, lives on less oxygen than the rest of us. Just give her a little on the nasal cannula and she'll be back to normal in no time. But Betty, the other nurse and I, we knew better. Knew she was exhibiting some of the classic symptoms of respiratory acidosis. Convinced the doc to order an ABG and you know what her O2 sat was? 54! Like to have done a backflip when I saw that, I was so surprised. Well, about that time, old Myrtle passed clean out and we knew what was coming next. She was going to have to be intubated. Never did like it much myself. Luckily nowadays, you young whippersnappers got a respiratory therapist to do it for you. Sure doesn't hurt to know how to do it anyway, as you can see. Well, Becky will be explaining all that anyway. Now, if you don't mind, I think I'll get back to that catnap I was enjoying in my rocking chair. Some of you may be wondering why intubation is like a topic of discussion in nursing. Respiratory therapy is responsible for that, right? Well, think again. Intubation is like most certainly an area nurses need to be knowledgeable in. You want to keep your patients alive, right? Mm, hopefully most of you said yes. Well, here it is. Intubation. So simple math. No airway equals death. Hopefully you've learned that much by the end of nursing school. If your patient cannot support their own airway due to decreased airway tone, failure to oxygenate, decreased level of consciousness, like whatever, they're probably going to have to be intubated. Nervous so yet? Well, relax, because you're about to learn what you need to know about adult intubation. In an emergency situation, there are several things a nurse can be responsible for at like any given time. Preparing and gathering equipment, pre-oxygenating the patient, medication administration, and vital sign monitoring. So, so you're going to have to like prepare the BVM, which will connect to the O2, have oropharyngeal and nasopharyngeal airways available, assemble at least two ETT tubes, one the estimated size of the patient, and one like a little bit smaller and get the icky suction wand thing ready and have some warm IV fluids hung. So the next step is to like check the intubation tray equipment. So you need a laryngoscope and check that the handle is securely attached to the blade and that you have a good light source so like the doctor can see stuff. A 10 milliliter syringe to inflate the ETT cuff, tape to secure the tubing following intubation, some McGill forceps, which are basically a set of forceps that like get shit out of people's throats. A bougie, which is used to help the ETT tube, and an ETCO2 monitor that is connected to the ETT immediately following intubation to ensure placement. Okay, so time for like my favorite part, the drugs. So there's three major classes of drugs you're going to be responsible for giving. Pre-treatment medications, which like numb and relax you all crazy like. Induction medications, which provide like decreased level of consciousness to so like ease intubation procedure, and paralytics, which like act as muscle relaxants. So make sure that you have all the syringes labeled correctly and like set them aside so you don't accidentally use them on something else. And like perfect, just in time, your patient is here. So you're like the airway nurse, so get you to the airway. So the patient is like paralyzed and ready to go and you the nurse is like maintaining the cricoid pressure to protect the airway. So like the correct positioning for the head you gotta like slightly flex the neck and like extend the head. It looks super crazy and weird, like the exorcist or something. Once the doctor <laughs> intubates the patient, connect the ETT to the CO2 monitor and the BVM. While the doctor is like bagging the patient, watch the monitor to make sure there's like a good flow on there. Also take the lungs for, for equal airway entry and the neck for any air leakage around the cuff. Tape up the tube and report the length of the ETT and the size of the ETT and report that to like the scribe nurse. And like, congratulations, bro. Your patient is not dead. Rock on!